My name is Ali Hunter from Euclid Scotland and for the next 30 minutes or so I have uh, the absolute pleasure of hosting a conversation uh, with the one and only Matt McStravick. Um, before I introduce Matt, uh, both Matt and I want to reach out to you. Um, we want to make this session as interactive uh, as possible. So if you have any questions for Matt, um, please do drop them in the chat and we will bring as many uh, of them in uh, as possible. Um, Matt is a service designer, a serial social entrepreneur and director of uh, design agency Deeper. Uh, Deeper work with companies and charities around the globe to design greater human connection into services, teams uh, and systems. Um, they've worked with uh, the YMCA, Children's Society, Google, Stanford Social Innovation uh, and so much more deeper focus on uh, relational design. So that's creating safe and enriching connections on and offline. Um, we know that relationships and connections are at the very core of uh, our youth work practice. Um, so as we explore uh, these digital spaces uh, and how we improve uh, outcomes for ourselves as workers and for young people, it's a brilliant chance to, to hear from, from one of the world's leading um, um, thinkers uh, in this space. Um, colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Matt McStravick. Matt, can I first ask you, um, tell us something in your world that's exciting you right now and tell us something that's challenging you. <laughs> well, first, thanks, thanks for such a kind intro. Um, uh, that's very kind of you. Um, something that's really exciting me right now and something that's really challenging. Is that right? Please. Okay, so something that's really exciting me right now. Hmm. Oh, God, I, I hate being put on the spot like this. Um, I guess I'm, um, I'm part of a piece of work at the moment that is uh, a Catalyst piece of work. So it's with the Catalyst Digital Network, supporting charities, doing all sorts of digital um, uh, services and product design. And something that I'm really excited about is that there are like 30 of these organisations as part of the, this uh, project with Deloitte that is just kicking off and just having had a look at all the, the challenges that are coming through from the challenges uh, from the charities and what they want to what they want to uh, uh, kind of focus on for the next six, six to eight weeks. It's pretty exciting. I won't share any of the specifics right now, but um, I guess what's particularly exciting to me about it is that. You know, two or three years ago, certainly pre-COVID, we were finding um, uh, a lot, the majority of charities really quite an early stage, uh, not necessarily digital development, but digital thinking. Um, and now that has really changed. And um, uh, charities, through necessity, of course, uh, through COVID, were many of, many of whom were like putting up digital services almost overnight. And it was amazing. And I think through that, steep learning curve definitely wasn't comfortable for anyone to do that but i think what's happened is that the social sector has really raised the bar in terms of digital capabilities and uh, so that's pretty exciting um for me challenging for me like i feel like every day there's some kind of challenging popping up let me come back let me come back to that if i can i'll give you something but you know i want it to be valuable so uh, i'll come back if that's okay Okay, perfect. Matt, we're going to jump straight in, if that's okay. Um, and, and I hope you don't mind um, me sharing with the group. The, the first time that I heard you speak was right at the start of lockdown. And the world, you know, we, we remember back to that time when overnight things just seemed to be slipping out of our grasp, control, ideas about what would come next, fear, worry. Um, and, and it was an incredibly tough time for everybody in lots of different ways. That was one of the first times I heard you speak, and I was thinking, what do we do in this space, right? We support some of the most vulnerable members of society. We are used to being face-to-face. -face. We're used to being in communities. We're used to being in tight relationships with our young people. What comes next? I heard you speak and talk about um, the human connection framework, and instantly, instantly my world changed with that. It gave me a confidence to think about my work 
which I'd been doing for 25 years in a different way. It gave me confidence to articulate the golden digital thread that has run through that work for a very, very long time in a way that I'd never been able to do so before. Um, and it, it really inspired me to start making those big leaps that you talked about there, about saying, this is how we do it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but we absolutely have some of these tools. So, so thank you for giving us that human connection framework. Can you tell uh, those folks that are on the call who maybe haven't heard about human connection framework, what it is um, and, and where did it come from? Yeah, sure. So, um, first of all, so yeah, it's really important to say that, as you did in your intro, that kind of at the centre of what we do at Deeper is human connection. So whether it's offline, online, um, whether it's, you know, big digital platforms or Zoom conversations, internal cultures, digital services, everything we do has at its very centre the, um, the conviction that there is a human problem at the center of every service design problem. So that's kind of the, our starting point. We've been working in this space for about six, seven years now. And my background's in the social sector, as you said, like developing different um, uh, social enterprises. But um, it wasn't until COVID hit, you know, everyone thought prior to COVID, everyone thought it was a great idea, but the market wasn't wasn't coming to us and asking us to do lots of work on this. So we were really kind of uh, early stages and doing a lots of lots of other things that weren't quite what we really wanted to focus on. But um, as so, almost as soon as COVID hit, we were commissioned by again by the Catalyst Network to really look at what charities were doing in terms of developing new digital services and seeing how we could enable them to weave more human connection into those services we knew that there was a big challenge we knew that so much of the value that people get from the charities that they engage with is not just the kind of primary goal of that of that charity so it's not getting housing support or um uh, or you know engaging with youth services necessarily it's the it's the sundry it's the bits that happen between it's the chat at the front desk going for a coffee after a with someone else it's the human interaction and digital by default does not provide space that kind of interaction it just doesn't and speaking to digital as part of the human connection framework piece to us we never we never thought that it was our job because people get their human connection offline but all of a sudden everyone's online most of the time we need to up our game so I think we spoke to about 50 or 60 charities and we worked with them over a period of three or four months, initially to find out everything that they did that they that they imagined might be developing human connection in their charities offline. And then use all of those examples to start picking out what the what the most salient conditions that we could see in each of them. And what we found across across, I think about 80 to 90 um we would call like methods for human connection that they spoke about, we found that there were five conditions that were almost always present within those, within those um, human connection interactions. The first one was presence. Like if we're not paying attention, if we're not really there, then there's no hope of us having uh, any approaching uh, a meaningful human connection with others. So keeping things fresh and new, we a really good way of like keeping, keeping everyone um, uh, and we use that in, in Zoom calls by doing like different engaging activities, lots of tools that are in the framework. Also in more static digital developments, perhaps a, a website or other kind of web tool, changing the colours on the homepage once a month. Something like that is enough to be slightly arresting and people, you know, back to the room, if you like. The second one is equity. Now, this isn't to say that we don't recognise and acknowledge, but wherever we can find small or big ways to become equals with each other in a digital space and offline also we would we would thoroughly recommend and it almost always appeared in human connection now yeah this can be really big ways of distributing roles between groups in an even way but just you small um, just using simple language to describe what you're doing is a really good way of creating and inclusivity um i, I want to jump in and, and just say i don't think we haven't invented anything that's all all we've really done is notice connections between things and start to say look there are connections here we can work in this way so hopefully what we what we're confident in now because 
the, the framework has been live for almost two years and there's thousands of downloads from our site continually um, is that we um, what we what we do is we give people a new lens to look through the work that they're planning and they're doing so they can design with human connection in mind. Sorry, jumped away from it now. But the next one of our conditions is see. So it's not it's not important what we do together that we have a that we have, but also how we do it. So we in digital connection in digital interactions as well. Accountability, something that's always comfortable in our sector, dealing with working with vulnerable users, but actually provide some motivation so that there is something to gain from all of us, from like maintaining a high level of experience for us all, whether we're service providers or service receivers, is really, really important. And lastly, something that we call whole self. Actually, what it really means is the, the psychological safety that we all need to experience in order to bring a little bit of our whole selves. Those kind of those kind of life aspects that we might look out by thinking they're not professional or anything like that. Now, of course, there's a balance to be had. There's an appropriate level of whole self. But we would say tools like check-ins, and we've got a number of those I can point to, are really, really good at the beginning and at the end of sessions just to give people... Um, uh, um, a, a, an opportunity to share some of their whole selves. I'll share one of those methods with you because it's just it pretty much my favourite and it's dead simple. We call it the three emojis and it's all in the name. It's at the beginning of a session. We invite people, always an invitation, never a requirement, to share their three most used emojis from their phones. Now, if you try that, what you'll find is that you can share a little or a lot with those three emojis. People, young people, perhaps who really don't want to, who have yet to develop trust with you and so on, they might share some emojis and say nothing else. But whatever happens, we all know each other a tiny little bit more when we know those three emojis. Um, so that's one, that's an example of one of the methods that came out of this. So, yeah, I think we've developed like 50 methods um, as part of the catalyst piece. They're all based upon those five conditions. And there's some great stuff in there. Though I would say for anyone downloading the framework, it's free to download. What well, it will cost you an email address, but um, if you download it, I would I would suggest use the methods to inspire you, but use the conditions to guide you. Those conditions are really super solid and really worth paying attention to. Um, so we put it out. Yeah, I think midsummer two thousand and twenty, um, and we we know that it's been really widely adopted and um, put into practice. Uh, and, you know, there's been quite a lot of demand from the private sector as well. So companies like Google and Grosvenor have asked us to go in and train some of their, uh, Google train their designers in these kind of methods and the approach and other corporates um, uh, wanting to know how they can use those for their internal cultures as much as their customer facing um, work. Uh, that feels like a, that feels like a rapid download of, of what that was, Ali. It's, 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 it's so different in lots of ways, Matt, to, to some of the, the practice that us as youth workers have, but so much of it is similar as well. So we talk about presence, right? Youth work is an experiential activity. Um, you know, we have to build those relationships um, and, and, and we're driven by those experiences with young people. Equality is, is embedded in everything um, that we do. Agency is about young people's choice to participate, choose to be involved or, or not to be involved, choose the, the rules by which they are involved. Responsibility, well, no growth happens without having a responsibility to each other or to a cause or to a community or whatever. So, so those synergies are there for us um, in, in youth work. And, and for me and, and for anybody who, who's done, you know, doing digital youth work better and better was a core plank of, of YouthLink's response to, to the pandemic. But how do we um, equip um, youth workers to, to deal with that? Because when the whole world was shutting down, it was our youth workers that were running towards the young people in need. You know, when big organisations were, were perhaps paralysed because they were bigger bureaucracies and they had to figure out how to work all their moving parts, our nimble youth work teams and, and, and individuals were saying, look, we can do this now, we can pivot on a, on a thing. So, so as part of our um, doing digital youth work better and better, we use the human connection framework to articulate a lot of those big ideas. So, so, so hopefully that framework is um, 
is in people's consciousness in terms of, of the youth work sector, but it's certainly a point where we can now start to expand that. We've hopefully passed the worst of the the, the knee-jerk reaction to what's happened in the world. And and for one, I'm I'm massively optimistic about the future. So um, I, I, I'll share a favourite quote of mine. So David Cooper Ryder is the godfather of appreciative inquiry. So for those that don't know, appreciative inquiry is, is the study of what gives life to a, a living system. David Cooper Ryder says that culture is born in the crucible of crisis. So what it is that we're doing now, what we're choosing to prioritise right now, what we're choosing to prioritise when things go really, really bad, i.e. the last couple of years, will have a disproportionate impact on what comes next. So in the last couple of years, when we've been prioritising relationships, we've been prioritising development, we've been prioritising the needs of our young people and trying to help them co-create and co-design uh, a new way of working, we have been really embedding that into our next future. So I'm so excited about what comes next because we've we've developed more awareness and creativity and confidence with digital as a thread that runs through our work in the last couple of years than we have done at any other time. And, you know, I've been doing this gig for 25 years. I've been using digital for 25 years, but I have never seen it sprint quite like I have now. And, and for me, there's an incredibly exciting future that is on demand, that is more young person centered, uh, it's more responsive, it's more evidence based. And for me, that can only be um, a good thing. Do, do you have any examples specifically that you've been working with either in the private sector or, or the charity sector that you know you can maybe articulate in a practical way about some of how that human connection stuff is being used by organizations um, that, that you can share with us today? Yeah, sure. So, um... Firstly, I'd say that, you know, we as designers now, we use the human connection framework, our lens through any service design problem. It's something that we worked on with um, uh, National Young Persons. Uh, we, they were working with people, young people at risk of sexual exploitation. So we did some research with those young people to find out what their needs were uh, on their initial meetings with caseworkers. What we found uh, when we synthesize of the research is that they needed to be confident, they needed to have a good sense of control, clarity as to what might happen in their first session. And also they needed to have trust in the practitioner. And that was like nigh on impossible before they've actually met to be able to ensure all of those things. And we investigated a lot of solutions that might be, that might be valuable. The one that we landed one on was really, really simple. So there is a, an online survey tool called um, video um, video ask and um, it's essentially yeah so it's a it's, it's a tool whereby you can create surveys just like you would um, using typeform or, or another kind of provider um, but the key is that you can ask you can video yourself asking a question and the person responding can answer with a text or with video or just with a voice message and we thought this could have a really useful value if um, caseworkers made a short video where they introduced themselves, where they um, shared a little bit of their whole selves in those in that introduction call. They asked some questions around what the young person would like to do in their first session. Um, they, they asked them how they would like to interact. Would it be face to face? Would they like to do it over SMS or some other other means? And, um, and so what we were doing there is trying to create a way that there was a runway to engagement for young people where they could gain a little bit of an idea as to what they were going to be doing in that first session, some agency in being able to, in being able to make decisions as to what to do, definitely um, reduce the, uh, the, uh, the tension in those first sessions. I mean, not just in these, in almost all all uh, work with vulnerable people, that initial session, that's the hardest step, right? And it's also a microcosm of what they're going to come to expect from the service as a whole. So I don't need to tell you, like, it's, it's really vital. So we found that repurposing uh, an off-the-shelf, no-code digital tool, it's about £20 a month to subscribe to it. We were able to address really quite a significant challenge for young people engaging in services to give them so much more autonomy, so much more con uh, uh, control as to how things how things work. I guess the really interesting bit for me in this problem is is that 
it's addressed, it's used digital to address a problem that in real life solutions can't really address. So this isn't about using digital to try to, um, uh, to, to, to kind of make up for the failings of digital. We do a lot of that. We do a lot of that work where we're really trying to uh, redesign chatbots and so on. So they're far more, we've got far greater level of genuine human connection. I can speak to that point. But, um, but yeah, this was one where it, face-to-face work just can't really overcome this particularly well. But the video ask can address it really smoothly. And it's now been adopted by that charity and rolled out nationally. Yeah, fabulous. There's, 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 there's so, so much in there, Matt. One of the things we, we talk about with, with youth work practice is that youth workers are often there at the points of connection, of disconnection and, and of reconnection. So we're you know, right in that moment where those, those culmination of events and experiences are, 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 are there, you know, that crisis moment that David Cabrera talks about. Um, and we're able to interact in a way that safeguards the young person's space, that safeguards their agency, that promotes their equality, that promotes their well-being, you know, that, that is empathetic in a way, that drives connection, you know, that, that prioritises their needs rather than our need or perhaps our, our, our organisation need. And, and th- those, are, those are the core moments, you know, the gold nuggets, we call them, or whatever way we want to, d- to describe those. Um, and that ability to use digital to add to that and to support that, those core moments is just incredibly powerful because it sets, it sets a, 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 an expectation there, that, you know, that, that together, we can collect the right information at the right time. You know, we can take those little steps in that journey because you know we don't build that relationship with our young people instantly when we meet them and we have that full relationship. It is a process. It is little by little, bit by bit. And inherently, and I don't want to get too abstract about this, it's a human process, right? We, we feel our way out of on and around our emotions and our sensitivities and... Um, but traditionally, as you talked about, digital has found that really difficult to do because, because it's a, almost like a flat landscape, whereas the world that we live in is, is really three-dimensional. The stuff about chatbots was really interesting. Could you tell us maybe about how what, what would have been a very flat human um, digital interaction has been made more human? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, I'll start by saying that um, we, are, we are far from digital evangelists as an agency. Um, we recognise that there's a, a that, that digital does present us with lots of problems, particularly with human connection, and that is that is precisely why we work in this space because we're not going to be online less in the coming years. We're going to be online even more, and so we need to find ways to reduce the separation between online experience and offline experience. Um, and there are some ways that we can do that, and there's some ways that we should avoid as well. So in terms of chatbots and chatbots get a bit of a rough ride. People definitely don't prefer to use them as their first um, interaction with a charity, uh, uh, especially when they're in crisis. But there are some things that we can do. First of all, we cannot call it a chatbot. Um, I would say that the best thing to do would be able to call it an information tool or something similar. What we're not trying to dress it up as is something that we can have a meaningful conversation with. And I think no one is fooled by that. And I think very often when we try to uh, create something that's a facsimile of a conversation in that way, we fail and we lose, we lose people's trust. Um, so we should never pretend that there's a real person on the, other le- on, the other, on, on the other end. Having said that, we should say where all the content for the answers in this information tool is coming from. For example, all of the information in this tool has, been, has come from our team great if you can have photographs of your team around there and they've spent a long time working on these issues and they're in a position to be able to answer many of the questions that come up and address many of the needs you know maybe maybe slightly shorter than that but like something something like that is really useful thing to have in there um rehumanizing some of the content is incredibly valuable i think that is where tone of voice is really is really helpful when i know as a user that I'm not trying, I'm not being trying to be tricked into aging with a real person on the other end. 
I'm far more amenable to the tone of voice of someone providing friendly advice. And very often, charities to find out what that is, um, we to their service teams so that we can find out what would you say when someone comes to you with this. And so we use those kind of bits to formulate sentences in with chatbots. Um, I've already said use simple language, um, and that 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 goes here too. Um, and I've kind of touched upon this, but what's really, really important in developing those kind of tools is to use social proof. And what I mean by that is wherever there is an opportunity to, uh, when someone's answered a particular question in a particular way, to have a little image pop up of a real person who's gained some value from your service with this particular challenge, with a little quote, that's incredibly useful. So what we're not trying to do is... Um, is create a kind of seamless experience for people in terms of the conversation flow, but actually far more to give them to give them a very real experience that they might that they uh, similar to that that they might receive in your in in, in your centre, for example. Um, I guess one other thing to drop in there because it's really important is that sometimes when we go through these chatbot experiences, they can be quite lengthy, and what we would say is. Um, Try to provide value to the person who's engaging with a chatbot at various instances. So if someone has presented a particular problem, they might be they might be really in crisis. They might be using this tool at one o'clock on a Sunday morning um, and, and really in a bad way. And if we're able to say things like, thanks, Joseph, what we know is that we we speak to 120 people every week with this particular challenge. And we are able to support 95% of those people to a good solution. Now, at one o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, if I get that message, then that hasn't addressed my problem. But it tells me that I'm in the right place. And it tells me, believe it or not, that I'm being heard in that way, that what I'm saying is landing with um, the organisation. So I could go on with that. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a real number of ways, things that we can do to really improve that, improve that experience for people. Yeah, brilliant. There's, there's, there's so much in there. Again, that synergy around being valued, being seen and being heard. Right? Ask any youth worker, you know, what's at the heart of that relationship and any good youth work experience. It's, it's that the young person is valued, seen and heard. Um, and also the, there's, a, there's a quote I love from um, Tarana Burke, the founder of the Me Too movement. It says, when, when, um, when, you, when you don't hear me, I think you can't see me. And often when we're interacting with, with digital or in, in new ways, we get a little bit wrong, the impact could be much bigger. So so building in this humanizing element to this is not just, you know, it's not a digital problem. As you said, just to take us right back to the start, at the heart of every digital issue, it's a human problem, it's a human solution to that. It's, it's, we're just going to look within and, and, and in that, extending that out a little bit to say, you know, no, the world of no code that we're in right now offers us the most incredible off-the-shelf responses to this that with a little bit of creativity, with a little bit of getting to know the young people that we are working with, we can tailor in such a way that young people can can really, uh, their experiences with us can be amplified. Um, uh, and it's not a replacement, but but we can just, you know, we can be so much more expressive and creative with our work with young people. Yeah, so as a, as a, as a sort of guiding light for that sort of work, I would suggest that you know, for example, when we're developing digital services, it's it's really quite easy and very natural for us. Let's just take the example of a, of a form that needs to be filled in. Ordinarily, face to face in real life, we might sit with a young person and actually look at the form together, have a conversation about it and fill in the bits as they come up. Um, when we go to put that put that form into a digital format, it's really natural for us just to put the form there and have it there and ask people to fill that out online. And so I would say as a guiding light, let's not use digital to, to get the job done that gets done in any given instance, but let's use digital to mimic the experience that people have had offline. So the experience of having the conversation. And there is, you know, we can, we, again, we don't need to do that in big ways all the time. And I, I would add something else as well, which is sometimes in using digital, it's just really, really difficult to find an opportunity for human connection. And what I would say to that is, when that happens, go fast. Make it as seamless as possible, as low friction 
try to get people through that little bit of admin or whatever it is. But where there is opportunity, then slow down, give space for that, enable people to comment, give time for people to come back and answer questions and talk about things themselves. Um, and just so just as a sort of, you know, just as a kind of um, rule of thumb, it's like, how can we go fast when we need to go fast? And how can we go slow when we've got room to go slow?